No my Heidi Maiki Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. All Black squad named plenty to chat about. Not too much of a different squad from what we've seen, but we still see TJ Pedernata there. We still see Sam Kane there. So plenty to talk about there. And we have Jason Ryan, the All Blacks forwards coach, on the show today to really dig deep into that. So we'll get into that. We've got the Sexton v Ioane thing, which has obviously heated up people on social media. The Blackferns didn't look good against England. That did not go well. So what can they do before France? We've got the player Mike again, Kirk Eklund from uh, Bay of Plenty. He's always got plenty to say, so a mic on him is good fun. And we look at the FPC final and the NPC quarterfinals as well. Plenty to get into. Bryn Hall, not here today. The harbour season ended. It didn't end well, Jipper. Um, but it ended, and so, you know, he's got his end-of-season celebrations. <laughs> yeah. But, boy. Uh, mm, score 65 points against Canterbury. Record total, and then... Up and down. Nearly get 65 points scored against you um, down on Invercargill. Look, Invercargill's on an easy place to go and play, but... Uh, with the squad that Harbour have, they, they should have done a better job than that. So we will have Bryn back next week, of course, but now let's talk about this All Black squad. No real differences outside of the fact that Cam Roygaard is in <laughs> and Noah Hotham's out. That was always going to happen, especially after the way that Roygaard played on the weekend. Yeah, well, yeah, yes and no. Um, you know, you probably thought Hotham might have snuck in there and, and you know, TJ um, had played his last test, but I think just because there is, um, you know, probably that lack of experience. It doesn't necessarily mean both Sam and he are going to play, mm. um, but it means they've played such a crucial role in preparing the side to be at its best that they can't um, you know, avoid not having them in that squad and they need to build that experience while they've got them. Single figure halfbacks outside of, as far as test caps are concerned, outside of TJ Pettinata, that plays a big thing. It also says to me, Finley Christie's obviously not on the radar really because he's a guy who's played enough test matches to maybe be the experienced guy and they're not utilising him, they're keeping TJ there despite the fact he's off to Tokyo next year. Yeah, well, I think um, when Noah Hotham got picked, like he was sort of behind Finlay at um, Tasman. So um, I think it's a sign, it, you know, like it's, it's a hard thing, um, you know, styles of play. Like if you think about the relationship Finlay um, built with Joe Schmidt, who absolutely loved the way he played, loved um, how he um, sort of saw the game. And you have that famous story about Eric Rush and uh, when he first made the All Blacks, his dad said, look, it's only one man's opinion. Um, and it's a little bit like that. It is one man's opinion, but that opinion is the current All Black coach as his style doesn't fit the way they want to play. And it's not that he's not playing well. It's just that he, he sees other candidates, um, you know, I suppose, uh, playing a stronger form of footy that they they want to see and, and they need. So, and then we look at the loose forwards, Sam Kane's still there, despite the fact that there are good replacements there. We will talk about Dalton Papali and his return to counties later on in the show, but you've got Ethan Blackadder who's shown he can play any position he wants in the loose forward at test level and, and really excel and be committed to rucks and do the things that Sam Kane does. Luke Jacobson as well. There are options there, but Sam Kane is still there. Yeah, and what I'll be interested in is how much is he is he going to play as we've seen or is he there again similar style is making sure that these guys are best prepared um, to deliver against your England against your Ireland and against your France um, I think maybe initially um, guys will probably get an opportunity to put their hand up against Japan how well they go there and and we always say your only currency is your performance how well they go there may dictate um, you know, how it all sort of pans out uh, once they head north. Mm. And that brings us to Ruben Love. He's probably looking at a test debut there. Yeah, oh, you'd have to think so. He'll, he'll debut against Japan. Um, you know, it's, it's a tough one on um, Harry Plummer. He's, he's done a really, really good job from what I'm hearing um, in, in that All Blacks environment. But with Stephen Petrofetta back fit, um, Ruben Love, his ability you know, to probably be a fullback that can play 10. Stevens a, a, a 10 that can play fullback. There's just no, no space for someone like, like Plums in, in the squad. But again, he, he may um, you know, get some time against Japan for the All Blacks and then you know, play the rest in the All Blacks 15. And we're happy to say All Blacks forwards coach Jason Ryan joins us from Christchurch. Jason, you're down in, at home, are you? No, I'm down south actually in uh, Otamatata, down on Lake Benmore at the moment. Is this the holiday home? Yeah, just enjoying a little bit of downtime. <laughs> 
Got a lovely collection of jerseys then behind you. The red jerseys. <laughs> this brings back a lot of demons yeah. for me. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> it is what it is. Let's talk about an all-black squad. Not a lot of change in the squad from what we've seen so far this year outside of Cam Rigard coming in. That was a relatively straightforward yeah. decision, though, I presume. I think it's a real credit to Cam on how he's uh, the ultimate professional, really, for a young fella. He's really, um, he's sort of put a huge amount of effort into getting him getting himself right. And um, we had him in the Wellington week and he pretty much trained fully and and looked look pretty dynamic. And obviously he's had a, a good run for counties uh, in the weekend. So really great to see him see him back from which was a nasty injury. You know, he's in form nine of, of super footy, wasn't he? So great that he's um, put the effort in and looking forward to seeing him back in the black jersey. You must be really pleased with the players you sent back to NPC, they all looked like serious All Blacks, you know, like a real level above. And guys, you know, I, for me, I was really interested in George Bell. He had a massive game for someone that hasn't had a, a lot of minutes in the ABs, but you can just see how much he's grown through, throughout this year and that time he's had just at training with, with the All Black squad. Yeah, well, that, that's great to hear. Look, I think that, you know, we, we actually made a point of putting it on the boys and saying that, you know, they. They need to play like All Blacks and, and, and prepare accordingly and, and, and have a lot of pride in playing for their province, you know, and, and, and I think it's really, um, I think all, you're right, Jipper, all the boys that, that fronted um, played really well. You know, Belly um, got his hands on the ball and, you know, he's building his body uh, nicely to the test level. Gillies and the medical team have put some good work into those boys and, and so did Pasaleo Tossi. I thought he was outstanding for Bay of Plenty and, and um, you know, like, it's great to see Paddy Toops. He, he looked fresh and sharp for Auckland. So, um, and then as the Dolts scored, mm. scored a nice try. So, yeah, good scattering. All of them um, put their hand up, which is good to see and important. And I thought Sammy Penny Finau was was really strong for Waikato. He, you know, he set up a couple of tries, but just his big frame and and his physicality would have been would have been nice to see. Yeah, it was. Look, you know, he's got a point of difference, hasn't he? Especially when he's on the edge, and um, yeah, he put it. He, he ran a couple of good um, change of angles off the ball, and put some guys away, and uh, that finished, finished tries. So that was good. Had a chat to uh, Ross Filippo before the before the game as well, and just made sure that he was on and prepared well, and got stuck into his game. And you know, those those communication channels between the PU coaches are important for us. I know they are for my area, so value that and. Um, yeah, he fronted up really well, and, and it's great for him. I'm interested in how that communication works because the players don't have a lot of time in camp with the teams, do they? So what is the message that you give to them from an all-black perspective about how they fit into those teams in a short period of time and excel and help within a different game plan and a different pattern? Yeah, look, I think that they've got to just, you know, back their instincts, really. You know, obviously the level's not what it is at a test level and the training level's not, not what it is, but that doesn't mean to say that they can't lower themselves to that, you know, to the to the provincial union standard, but they can they can lead their own areas and to do that they've got to lead themselves and, you know, we, we make sure that they get in and just know their role. They don't need to know everything um, and just, you know, go and, go and play some footy and, uh, and they did that and, you know, the coaches have all been great around the grounds um, and those communication channels have been, have been really open, which is... Uh, important for everyone. If we turn our heads now, it must be extremely exciting uh, for you as a coach um, taking on what is going to be, you know, three massive tests in, in between, I suppose, in J Japan and Italy. Yeah, it is. I, I think the whole year has been, to be honest, like right from when that calendar came out and you knew we, we had, you know, a couple of tests against South Africa in South Africa, world champions, how good. Um, after a World Cup year, there's, there's two ways you can look at it. You can go, oh, it's a lot of tests. We go, this is exactly what we need. Mm. And I believe the calendar is that. And, um, you know, it finds out where your pressure points are pretty quickly. And I think we've we've grown a bit in that space, definitely. And um, I think when you look at heading north, you know, Japan, she's going to be reasonably hot. So there'll be a lot of movement in the game. They play fast. And then we head straight to England and short turnaround Ireland, then France. So that'll give us different challenges that we'll need to adapt pretty quickly and, and, and find out um, where our game's at, which, you know, we're, we're growing all the time. I think we found a, a lot of lot about ourselves uh, in that South Africa series and, and, and also the finishing part of the games, which we've put a lot of work into um, through the bleeders lows. So 
it is exciting and, and heading to Europe is is awesome as an all black team, you know, the, the crowds and the, the atmosphere, it's it's pretty special to be a part of, so we're looking forward to it. What is that key area that you've found out about yourselves? Is there anything that's really stood out? I think that we're just sort of growing our week, really, and how we prepare and what we put in front of the boys and understanding that at the All Black level and test level, you actually don't need to give them a lot. I think we, you know, you come in and you're a new type coaching group and you're just trying to make make your own mark on, on the team. And I think as we as we found out, the probably the less we have, the better the boys would would play as simple as that sounds and I think that that's what that's what we're growing all the time in our preparation individually our own units but also as a whole coaching group you know that when you look at the uh, South African series you know we, we were actually really satisfied with how we um, pushed the box and you know we had a chance to win both tests but we didn't and we didn't we didn't sugarcoat that and when you look at them they've you know what seven odd years together they know their game they know their identity we We've been together seven weeks, um, so that's a reality. But um, we, we we we'll get there, and I believe that we're trending up, and we've we've showed um, some good glim- glimpses of of young All Blacks at the you know I think it's eight new caps in a season, which is exciting. So you find out all the time around those accuracy and and those moments at the end that are so important because the pressure and the game it just shifts so fast. You know, you've never really got a lead. Score, teams can score so quickly. So respecting that and um, trusting our game is, is something we're always looking to evolve, really. And an area that seems to have improved a hell of a lot and an individual player, Tupo Va'i, the line-out defence, the, the box are traditionally a very, very strong line-out, but you had some really strong wins in and around stealing or disrupting that pill. Yeah, oh, Tupo's been exceptional. Um, look, he's, he's carried on some great Super Rugby form, and you know, I think I've said this before. What, what people probably don't see is, I think it's a reflection of being playing a lot of rugby with Brody Rattel at the Chiefs, and then he's come in. He's been in the All Black level when he's he's worked alongside Sam Whitelock and and Scott Barrett and and Paddy Toops. You know, with him being injured, it became came an opportunity for Toops, and, and he really took it. I think it's a reflection of the work he does during the week his homework and his preparation and you know he's becoming a man at the test level which is a lot different to super level and he's taken he's made the most of his opportunity and he's a big part of our line out group and a real leader within within the four pack and I'm really pleased for him and and, and just, the best is yet to come and if we focus keep focusing on that line out and an area you know Kieran Reid sort of dominated as a loose forward that ran line outs was a great operator but the growth in line-out work from Wallace Satiti, especially in those Wallaby tests, like he, he has just gone from strength to strength as well. Yeah, look, he's, uh, I think, one of the, well, there's a, there's a lot of positives about Wallace. You know, when you talk about a young player that's arrived in the test level and just um, thrived, it's almost like the bigger the contest, the better he goes. His explosive power um, with the ball, but also jumping, through his instincts and his speed off the ground really helps uh, the speed of our line out to be fair, Jipper. And as you know, as a hooker, if, if the boys know that they can hit the target and he'll, <laughs> he might pluck out a few loose ones because of his skill in the air, well, you know, he's probably saved us a couple of times through no fault of anyone in particular. But yeah, he's um, yeah he's really quick off the ground, which basically um, gets the ball in his hands and out of his hands to the nine really fast. And on top of that, his composure for a young man seems incredible. Oh, it is. He's, um, you know, he's from a great family. He's an extremely humble man. He's um, he's everything you'd want an All Black to be, really. He just um, he gets about his work. He's uh, extremely grateful. He's always looking to be better. He's always asking um, lots of questions. But the time he gets to the game, we just, we just want him to play. And he's done a great job with that. He's been exceptional and, and, and uh, really proud of him. The work he's done. When you look at Wallace, and then you maybe look at the halfback situation where you've got a couple of youngish players there, uh, is that the reason why we're still seeing Pedernada and Kane in the squad, despite the fact we know they're heading overseas at the end? You need those people when you've got, you know, such a big three Test matches in the middle of this tour. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. Um, look, I think both those men have, have been um, phenomenal in the leadership group and, and this is a big part of setting young guys up to succeed isn't it you know like they've been performing well on the field as well but if, if I look at 
you know, I guess the forward side of it with, with Sam Kane, I, I couldn't speak highly enough about the guy. He's just been an unbelievable leader and how he's come in this year, he's built his body back from a little bit of resilience and a few setbacks. Um, he, he challenges the group. He um, he challenges himself and he still wants to get better. But, you know, when we go north, we need experience, whether or not that's on the field or off the field. And, and they know this, the stage that they're at as All Blacks and heading into into next season, you know, they're not going to be there, and but they'll pass the baton so that, you know, we're having conversations about the Nimes like we just did with Tupo Vai, you know, they've, they've set, their, set guys up to succeed. So mm. um, they know their role in this Northern Tour and and um, I'm sure that they're going to push hard and and um, give back everything that they that they know they can and we know, that we know we, they can. You talked about Sam Kane then. Can you paint a picture of the kind of thing that Sam Kane will do to show leadership for these younger guys? He's a great one at helping, you know, players out on and off the field with their preparation or whether or not that's having a yarn to them walking off the field or if it's in the meeting room and, you know, he'll he'll ask anyone a question and and, and want to know the answer and he won't walk past anything. He won't, you know, sort of leave it and go. Oh, okay, well, if he's not satisfied that he's got the answer, hasn't got the answer, well, he'll make sure he's got it. And I think that that's through experience and through the resilience that he's worked through as an All Black and um, as an All Black captain. And he's he's helped Scooter and, as I said before, he's helped the leadership group in a, in a lot of ways and challenging. And he's been really invaluable. Like, as I said, I, I just can't speak highly enough about him and. Um, he's a special man. It's so great to see him play 100 tests. The way I've sort of articulated, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, like the All Blacks isn't a development team. If you're playing the best, you should be picked. Mate, you're so, <laughs> you're so right. Yeah, it's not like um, you can try much. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're not trying to build competition points to, in a round robin, are you? you? You're trying to win every single test. and. You know, we, we put a lot of effort into our, our trainings and making sure that they're really dialled in to set the boys up to succeed. But, you know, let's not forget Sam, you know, he, he's come in and effectively been the starting seven for the last four tests. Mm. So, you know, that, that's because he's been uh, right at the front of the room and at trainings and he's been leading on and off the field. So, uh, and you're right, the All Blacks isn't a development team, Jippa. You're 100% right and you've got to respect that and... and earning a test jersey is hard and mm. we don't give them away lightly. And, you know, people often do say, oh, you know, why isn't he get given an opportunity? But we see them train every day. <laughs> and, and we review our trainings and our meetings as hard as we do test matches. And whether or not we've won or lost and you didn't know the result on a Monday morning, you'd probably come in and go, geez, mm. did they win or lose? We're that hard on ourselves and we have to be. If, if we look at in terms of playing uh, on this Northern Tour, you said before, stripping things back has actually allowed you to perform a little bit better. What are those key areas for you, uh, not only up front, but as a, as a squad that you know that you need to nail to get the results that, that we all desire on this end of your tour? Yeah, there's probably a couple of parts to, that, to answer that question, but I think when our, when our ball carry and clean at the breakdown has, has got momentum and we're, we're accelerating into contact, that often means that the boys are clear, that they're not thinking about too much. And clearly the big rocks of set piece, you know, we need to be winning, you know, top quality ball for our, for our backs to score some tries. So, you know, I, I often talk about the highlighter pen to the boys, just pick your two things for the week and let's just, <laughs> it's why you had that at school. So, you know, you don't need to fill your whole book up, but at the end of the week, close it so you're ready. So um, I think that, you know, we, we've worked that out along the way as well. But, you know, when, when, we've, got, when we've got, you know, our forwards accelerating on the ball and, you know, our backs scoring nice tries in the corner, well, that's good. But sometimes winning test matches, it's all different. And, and can't say I've ever been too worried about whether or not it's one point or 30. <laughs> Just win the test and, yeah. and you, you celebrate that. For you personally, um, and I know you won't, like, blowing your own trumpet, so let me do it for a bit. I've heard from a lot of players... Your point of difference as a coach is, is how much you care for them, but also what has been interpreted to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's that care like a parent that you're going to tell them when they're not doing right, but you're also going to tell them what, what they're doing well. Is, is that, you know, as simple as, as it sounds? It's a challenge and care um, environment. Jipper, look, it's, um, you know, these boys have got to be ready to 
go into the biggest hostile arena that they can be and it's my job to set them up to succeed and look the, the care I've always said you know players don't really um, care what you know until they know that you care <laughs> so if that means slipping into my room for a peppermint tea and a bit of a yarn about a few things and and being a little bit vulnerable and um, having a conversation around um, their families and, and how things are at home. You know, the All Blacks, we're, it's a different beast, the All Blacks. We're always moving. You know, mm. we're having meetings at airports. Mm. You know, Super Rugby, I've often said you got your own cafe, your own coffee shop, you got your own bed. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we're constantly on the go every week. We haven't actually got a home. So just making sure they're right on that front, but also, you know, whether I've whether or not they've played one test or a hundred, you still got to treat them the same, and that, that's through honest feedback. And um, it's never about them, but it's for them. And when you can have the meeting room like that and um, get to know them, and you know, I like to have a lot of fun along the way, as as well as give it to, <laughs> to them between the eyes when they need it, and um, they, they respect that. And as long as it's coming from a pla- from a place that's uh, fair and reasonable. But yeah, I, I do care about the boys, and I think when they, um, you know, when they know that, and they know that I piss them off there and again as well, <laughs> and that's all part of the part of the journey. She's not; um, it's not always pretty, but you know, you just be honest and get on with it. Many takers on the peppermint tea. Yeah, I know the boys. The boys love a peppermint tea. It's um, it's good. They, uh, yeah, it's a good couple of bit of banter. The doors always open. Always tell that Artie loves coming in and having a bit of a yarn and, you know, sometimes it's just a chance to, to chat about anything really and, and not even footy. They just come in and sit down and have a chat and, um, you know, it's it's a safe place to have a chat to and, you know, they, they've got to be able to do that and, um, and trust you. Right. So you take a box with you, do you, or does Cat Darry um, sort yep. you out or how does it work? No, no, I've always got a box here. I always um, take my own, a couple of different varieties. Um and yeah, the boys just come in and one by one, or sometimes we might get half a dozen in, and then I end up saying, "Boys, you you talk, start to talk talk a bit of bloody rubbish here." <laughs> <laughs> We're getting off task, but uh, there's been some good yarns. It's um, just a bit of fun, really. <laughs> Jeff, from your point of view as a player, was that one of the things that you really enjoyed about going when you had a coach that you could really confide in, that you could you felt that safe place and you were able to go? Yeah, I think the word Jace used, and and it's probably the one thing that. You know, I really connected with Tom Coventry. I think everyone knows that I <laughs> wax lyrically about it probably too much. Sorry, TC, but it's vulnerability. You know, like, he never, ever tried to have every answer. You know, and I think that's the best thing is, is and, and, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to witness Jace the same, is, you know, they pose questions to you. They, they, they help you solve the issue. They don't just give you the answer. And if you can do that as a coach, that's how you get that learning and that growth as a, as a player, and, and it's massively fulfilling because you actually feel like you've got there. And often in a review or in a training, if someone asks you, you know, where do I need to be here, and it's part of the back strike, is just say, look, I'm actually not sure. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there's a pause. So what do you mean? You're the cut? Well, no, I'm, I'm doing the fall. Look, there's Scotty Hanson going over yarn to him or Jace Holland because. Otherwise, I'm just making shit up here. <laughs> so you've got to be honest if you don't if you don't know the answer, you know. Yeah. I respect that too. Fair enough. Well, mate, we've got to let you go. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate the insight and uh, good luck. Best of the tour. Go well, mate. No worries. Great to chat and um, yeah, appreciate your support, guys. And of course, there was another big talking point today in New Zealand international rugby, and that's the Black Ferns up against England. This is supposed to be the biggest test in women's rugby. It wasn't much of a test for England. The Black Ferns got absolutely pummeled. Did not look good, Jip. Yeah, I think the biggest. I think it was a better performance in the Irish game. That is, that's one um, improvement. But I think the biggest concern um, for them is the defence. You, you just never. You can't rely on scoring 50 points to win a test match. Mm. And you know they obviously leaked a lot of tries on the edges. And that's not to say that edge defence is an issue, but potentially very tight in and around that breakdown and one or two passes is beating a, you know, a good um, number of defenders, which is just leaving them too stretched and stressed on, on the edge, and England took advantage of that. Over and over again. Yeah, well, if, if you don't make adjustments, you know, you're not going <laughs> to... 
go away from a, a, a play that's working. But, you know, the, the England are world number one. Uh, we always knew this test was going to be a challenge, but I thought we would be a little bit better after having that first um, test a, a number of weeks ago in Twickenham to what was coming. But it looked like England really, really evolved their game. I think the disappointment for me probably is that there were so many basic errors. I think a Hannah King dropping the ball at the 22 was basically no one around her, number of drop balls when the pressure was on, exiting again, that kicking game in their own half. They've talked about it with us, about how it's a work on, but it's not getting there. Yeah, and you have to think, you know, you could sense, I suppose, um, Alan Bunting's frustration after the loss last week, uh, but they, they presented a united front for, throughout the week, but there will be frustration, I suppose, on the coaches because publicly they've spoken they really want to you know, develop that kicking game and, and show that it's part of their uh, style moving forward. And it's clear it needs to be. You know, the, the women's game is developing. And I know not everyone loves um, kicking and, and that part of rugby, but, you know, and I suppose because there was so much success of just playing it at all costs um, in the World Cup, you know, there's elements of those players wanting to, you know, that's worked for them. They've won a World Cup doing that, so it's hard to, I suppose, change from that natural DNA. But because of the development in the game and the manipulation of uh, defence, if, if we don't get more of a kicking game and we can't play in better parts of the field, it just means you're going to run out of gas. You, you just can't play um, that amount of rugby against a team that is, you know, you know, kicking and tactically resting a little bit more throughout that game. As we see, they ran away with it in the end, and that, a lot of that comes down to the amount of work and effort that went in that first part of the game. I wonder with the World Cup next year where we're at. You know, I wonder about how much they're going to have to utilise the sevens players who quite obviously have better catch and pass skills, better ball skills all round. They worked last time. Could that happen again this time? Yeah, well, you've got to understand the professional game in sevens has been around a lot longer. So, you know, that, that skill set's been developed over a long time. Yes, they'll utilise them, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, you think about where that team was at prior to the last World Cup, no one really gave them a chance. That's true. You know, like they were, if anything, in a worse spot than what we'd currently see this side at. And they came and did something pretty special. Um, you have to think, you know, Wayne Smith has got a role there for, for both the All Blacks and the Black Ferns. And you have, no, you have to have no doubt that he is, um, you know, probably going to play more of a role or be assisting this coaching group as to how they find their way out of this. Mm. We have got a question here from Amy Olivia, who's a Kiwi based in the UK, and she's saying, why are we not talking about the coaching staff? This isn't working. It, because there's been a short turnaround between World Cups, it's actually quite difficult for them to bet in what they're trying to do, but it isn't working. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> opportunities as well um, to, to get these changes. You know, there's no other way to do it than being out on the field. And, you know, I think there's seven or eight tests the, in this calendar year. And, you know, in time that's going to grow, but that's the current you know, state of opportunities to play test match footy and, and get that cohesion factor. And to change your style from what you naturally play is, you just have to give it time. There's, there's no, you know, like it is, once you're out on the field, it, it needs to be on instincts and their instincts are still to attack at all costs. Yeah, you know, your mo most rehearsed action is gonna come to the floor under pressure. Currently their most rehearsed action is play. Mm. That, and over time, hopefully it will develop to balancing that, that attacking, um, style and management of play, but currently that's the most rehearsed action, so that's why it's their go-to. It's a bit ugly. The FPC final, uh, Canterbury playing. A lot tighter than expected. A lot tighter than expected. Yeah. I thought Waikato was going to walk over yeah. the top, but Canterbury have been in seven straight finals for a reason, right? You have to give it to Canterbury, though. Like They fought in the semi to come back late, mm. and then they were so close to, <laughs> to winning the final, which would have been miraculous. But from a biased aspect, I have to say I'm very good friends with uh, the Waikato coach and James Semple and um, really stoked for, for him. You know, sort of had the um, trouble with the MLR team going down. He's come back and, and that was an opportunity he's taken and um, to see him sort of face that adversity and, and uh, I suppose the, the mana he holds in that group. You know, they, they performed a haka to him in the sheds. He was presented with his blazer after that game. So, um, you know, what he sort of has instilled in that group was was really important for them getting getting home and um, they were the best 
in my opinion, they were the best and most consistent team across the season, so fitting that they became the champions. We're, we're out of the big game from the FPC. Now we're heading into the MPC quarters. Um, plenty of good action going on there. But before we get to that, Kurt Eklund, Bay of Plenty uh, hooker and one of Jipper's old teammates, was playing his 50th game for Bay of Plenty. If Aucklander, born and bred, played for Grammar, going back for his 50th game in Auckland at his old school. We mic'd him up, and this is what it looked like. Kurt Eklund returns to his school, Auckland Grammar, to play his 50th game for the Steamers. Yeah. What do you want, Cashy? Cashy, what do you want? Time! Time! Same again, get it! Oi! Spread out! Move over! Get up, Sahi! Hit him, hit him, hit him! Here come, Rossi. Zan Sullivan looks for the exit, it's been charged by Bay of Plenty, the chase is coming in! Just like that, the Bay of Plenty strike back through Jacob Norris. Good on you, Hawk. Nice boy. K50, baby. K50, let's get it. Boys, we've got to get our eyes up. Because they're looking to play Migs as well. So just make sure we're scanning the whole time, eh? It's <laughs> okay. It's okay. We love the D. Love D. <laughs> How you guys feeling? How you feeling? feeling. Alright, yeah, let's go, D. Hold here, hold here, D. Hold here, hold here. Hold here, hold, 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 hold. hold, hold, hold. <laughs> Eklund with the intentional overthrow to Nenka to Broughton. It is a clear open lane for Broughton. What a scene. Only takes 10 seconds, boys. <laughs> Just starting out with Kurt Eklund down there, right hand wing here. Close. Leroy Carter puts the kick ahead into the 22 now. Just like that, Bay of Plenty show how dangerous they can be. Oh, that kick's gonna be way better. Go past carry, boy. Oh, oh yeah, pass. Yes! Oh, I was under the sticks there. Did you get the offload or knock on? No! Leroy Carter gets in there, and he's in over the line now, not for the first time this game. We have seen the wingers come in for a pick and go stealing the glory from the forwards. Yes! K50, hey, well done, boy. Congrats. I thought you guys got a win for it, right? Cheers, boy. Well done, boy. Hey, what do you reckon? What do you reckon? <laughs> Two one, bro. Bro, you got a hip of yours. Bro, hip of yours. Oh, that's good. Hey, AC fifty, baby. Have you used your fishing rod yet? Heavy. Congrats, bro. It's okay. So entertaining as ever, because he's always got something to say, Kurt Eklund, right? Yeah, I'm sure there was a lot that couldn't um, oh, no, be, there was. be put <laughs> there was. to air, having played in that position. Sometimes uh, you can have a few slips of the tongue. Um, but what I loved about it is, is his actual leadership. Um, you know, he's been through adversity and he hasn't had it all his own way throughout his career. He has had to fight tooth and nail for every opportunity. And that's why I think he, he's just grown into such a great leader. Um, and and it's, it's, it's little things. He can give the stern message. You saw he even pushed, I think it was Tossi, you know, it's, it could be name action, but he wasn't getting a response. So he literally yeah. <laughs> gave a physical push. Um, you know, he was first to celebrate any try. He's sprinting in from miles away to, to congratulate teammates. And then, uh, you know, I was fortunate to commentate that game and I could hear it through my headpiece. His, his ability to grow the rapport with the ref was really impressive. He used humour in a really great way of, I suppose, just lightening um, the conversation but also getting his point across. And, you know, we've spoken it a lot um, on this show with, with Bryn and how you manage as a captain that ref relationship. And, um, yeah, I just was really, really impressed with, with um, you know, his leadership style and his ability to go from the stern to the casual and, and, and still be able to execute his role and play, play a really strong game.
What I loved was the way that he talked with his Blues teammates. I think there was one with Zahn Sullivan on the floor and there was another one in there as well. When you play against your teammates at super level, is there always that kind of chat on the floor, in a tackle, whatever's going on? Yeah, I always um, compare it to like your brother in the backyard. It's almost like when you're playing against your mates, you, it's more, um, more banter, but also it's a little bit more ruthless. You, you really want to get the result um, against them. So, you know, a lot of Blues players, both sides, um, you know, Bay Plenty had a, had a number of Blues players as well and um, previous Blues players that had played um, in the squad together. So uh, a lot of familiarity there. Um, but yeah, the, the banter is probably a little bit um, more relaxed at NPC level than you'd probably find at Super Rugby level. Uh, yeah. it, it just has that uh, difference of intensity and speed of game. Mm. Now, we've had a few questions through, of course, about the player mics that we've been playing to you over the last few weeks. This question came in from Michael Birch, and Michael will get you the player's sports uh, Gilbert ball for your question. He wants to know, how much do professional rugby players try to listen to what the opposition is saying during play? He says, I can imagine there's some listening when trying to decipher line-out calls and such, but do players spend the whole game eavesdropping? And how useful is it to do? Well, if you do your prep, it's very useful. So you, obviously there's mics on refs, there's, there's um, sideline mics for, for the, the sky, um, viewers, so uh, you go through a really thorough process if you're a leader within the group. I don't think you put that onus on everyone. There, there's sort of those key leaders that will listen and try and pick up cues and, and share that information, um, you know, in a timely manner that can get a get a result. But you, from a line-out point of view, you you almost tap it through mm. and try and figure out where you know because some teams have a magic number or they have a system in they'll use letters or, and you try and work out their system as best you can and, and go over a number of weeks to work out where certain calls can be. And then you, you would decipher that and deliver that to the team and say, if we hear this, this is where we want to sort of go up. Same with any sorts of moves or um, sort of, you know, like what a tip pass is or what the pass is out the back. So defensively, you're almost one step ahead, um, you know, and, and I think, Going into that depth of detail and doing that work is probably what takes you from being good to great. Right. And if you don't do that, you're, you're probably not going to progress as fast or as far as you, you, you'd like. So the eavesdropping is in the prep, not on the fly so much? No. No, well, you, you wouldn't be able to do it, I don't think. Um, well, I certainly wasn't able to. And, and I, you know, we talk about prep quite a lot on this um, podcast. And you, you'll get reward for that prep because... As I said before, the black ferns, it's instinctive. You've trained it all throughout the week, so it's not um, something that shocks you or you try to pick up. But if your prep doesn't lead to results, you've, you've got to drop it as well. You don't just keep going through with it because you don't get it right all the time. Mm -hmm. So you've got to acknowledge that really early and say, hey, that's not actually the go. They've, they've made an adjustment here. Mm -hmm. Sam so, Whitelock was the best at it, sorry. Yeah, yeah, but Sam Whitelock was the, was the best at it. And this is the amount of respect I showed him when we played the Crusaders is we would, we would have a total different system for against the Crusaders because he was so methodical and deciphering line out. <laughs> you had to do something new when you played them, otherwise um, he would steal all your ball. Sam is a smart cookie. He's he a is. smart cookie. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, Michael, for your question. Um, we will get you this player's sports ball. And for all of you who want to go to playersports.co.nz, you can use this QR code and include this code here, RugbyPod20. You can get 20% off all All Black supporters' gear, boots and balls, um, courtesy of Players Sports. So thank you very much for their support. Michael, get into it. Got another question regarding player mic as well. OK, we got this through from Brett Mead. He says, I love these mic'd up player segments, but how realistic are they? Are these players always this vocal or is it ramped up because they know they are miked. In my 30 years playing low-level amateur, I never heard such talking. Or is this indeed the differentiator between amateurs and the top level? Definitely. It yep. is not ramped up. And if you could see all of it, you, you'd understand it's not. Um, but it, it is a small insight to the level of communication you need and how fast and how quick you have that ability to, to communicate a name and action. And as we saw with Kurt, sometimes a physical push is, is critical to stopping a try or scoring mm. one. Mm. Mm. So as you went through the grades and as you got up to that level, did you have to actively learn to communicate? I mean, are there essentially communication classes within 
Uh, definitely at academy level, and you just won't progress. If you, if you don't talk on the field, if you don't have the ability to have the level of fitness to, to communicate, but also have the level of detail and understanding of the game plan and the systems, because as we always talk about, it, the, the, com, the comms from outside to in is what makes the first five shine. The comms from the first five into forwards, or like we talk about Bodie a lot defensively, um, is, is massively important to, to the success of a side. And, and you, everyone needs to be able to do it, because if you don't, you just, you just can't execute. If, if we don't talk to each other, we, we're going to have to guess. Um, you often see it, certainly on defence, there's a lot of chatter going on, but I'm presuming now with the way that the pod systems work, it's ramped up on the communication when it comes to forwards on attack. Yeah, massively. So we always talk about that pod system. So if, if you're the tip guy, you need to be you know, talking to the guy that's catching the ball because he's, he's looking in there and he has to either know he's just going to grab and carry because of that line speed pressure, or he's going to hold his feet, give a tip, or then there's always the overcall of the player out the back who has has the, but that small comms. Even um, if 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 you look at Kurt's thing uh, and go back and watch it, you listen how early he's like, "What do you want, Cashy? What do you want, Cashy?" So Lucas Cashmore, he's the first five. He's screaming as he's running. The kickoff's gone. He's screaming, "Cashy, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want?" So that once he's set, he can just do. And, and that is just constant throughout the game. Yeah, yeah, it's, and, and with the way that defensive work now, especially at international level, right in your face, it must be quite hard to communicate, right? You, there's a person here, it's hard to know your options, there are a number of them, it feels like a difficult thing to do. If you're feeling that, you just say carry. So there's like an overriding rule. If, if you're confused or you can't make a call, the safest option is just set a ruck. Just tuck and carry. Buy, buy some time. You know, even even latch on and try and get through a contact because, as as we've spoken about, if if you can average four meter carries as, as forwards and that tight stuff, man, you're you're playing on top of teams. You'll get that fast ball, and you won't need too many comms because you just get it to the edge and score. Mm, mm. So it's actually more important when you're under pressure. Yeah, massively, and also when you're under pressure, how you train that through the week, um, and and be able to deliver them in a calm manner. It's really crucial that you're not sort of overexcited or you're over eager. You can see a hole and you really want it and you're sort of calling it, but you call it so loud or um, you know the opposition here and that hole will shut. So you want to be subtle about your comms and those sort of small micro comms in between each other. There was a really interesting interview on Breakdown last night or it was Kieran Reid talking about Aaron Smith and the way that they work together as an eight, nine and the way they would at training literally walk up the field where Kieran was pretending he's at the back of the scrum and he'd have Aaron behind him and Aaron would be taking options. Mm. And it was like they would go up and down and up and down, just the two of them. So it became very clear and almost, they didn't even have to talk to each other by the end. They knew where they were going and how it would work. It was quite an interesting insight from two world-class players. So again, I hate to labour a point, preparation. Yeah. Preparation sets you up to deliver under pressure. And that's all that is. Is, is when you've got the time and you've got the ability to do those reps time and time again, as you know, I always like to refer to, to Kobe Bryant, but um, he, he, he referenced Steph Curry, he's the best three-point shooter, but he referenced in an interview, do you know how many he's done to mm. be able to do it that accurately? Yeah. You know, like during, during the week, what he's done to be able to just execute. And, and he goes, think about how many he misses, mm. but he's still the greatest ever but think about how many misses when he trains, and it's just those reps. The more you can get that repetition, he can almost shoot that ball with his eyes closed. Yeah. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Just as big a talking point this week has been the Johnny Sexton book and Rico Ioannis. And let's chat a little bit about that. Johnny Sexton in his book comes out, takes a crack. Rico posts on his social media, zombie, and you know, oh. lets him have it. Where is the line here? Oh. Look, it's, 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 it's a hard one, but look, there's so many things are said on um, the field. Um, and I, I just think there, there's a lot of feeling between those two sides after when they won down here. Um, I think everyone knows what Pete um, Amani said to, to Sam Kane, and um, I don't think what Rico said was the only thing said to Johnny Sexton on that field on that day. Um, I think, I think um, you'll find uh, he, he got plenty of feedback and, and so, did, so did a number of the other Irish uh, players and they, they, they give as good as they get. So um, you can't dish it out all the time if you, if you can't take it. 
<laughs> That's the interesting thing, isn't it? Because everyone thinks they're squeaky clean. <laughs> but, I mean, there's obviously Johnny quite... Sexton is certainly <laughs> not squeaky clean. So with was... players or refs, might I add. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's it exactly. So it was kind of weird to see it like that, to be claiming innocence to some degree and saying the All Blacks aren't classy. They talk about sweeping the dressing rooms, but no, you know. Yeah, well, that's uh, one thing I probably thought was um, unfair on on his behalf is. If he has one, an issue with one player, how he can, you know, reference the the All Black uh, legacy or, or reputation based on that seems a, a, a little bit far fetched. So, um, yeah, look, I, I've enjoyed it. I'm not going to lie, and I especially enjoyed Rico's reply. <laughs> um, and I, look, it's brought a bit of interest to the game, and and just shows you that there's still a lot of feeling and and off the back of losing down here, you know, they, they had the right to have their, their, their say and they didn't get to another semi-final and the All Blacks had their right to, to, to let them know about it. In a month's time we'll hear all about it. Well, it was quite all creative all too. <laughs> back 10. <laughs> get back 10, you know, technically just trying to help them out. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, nah, look, it's, it, was, it was very funny um, throughout the week and, and I thought Rico handled it really well. Yeah, yeah. What advice gets given to players about handling a situation like that? Because obviously we want talking points, we want honesty, we want personality in rugby, we want all of these things, but at the same time, you know, I suppose the traditional New Zealand approach has been relatively conservative in this area. Well, I think Rico's response was pretty conservative. Yeah. You know, like he didn't really say anything, he just said, I'm in your head. Yeah. And with a song. <laughs> and he is. Zombie. Yeah. You know, they play it at, at, at games and, you know, we've seen the South Africans sort of do a remake for Russi and... Um, you know, there, there, as I say, there's a lot of feeling in, in both sides, and I think it's an individual thing. I don't think you should ever dictate to someone that has had a personal attack mm. um, made publicly. I think Rico has every right to respond in the way he wants. You call me cynical, but, you know, you're selling a book. It's a great way of marketing. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Include it, a line it, like that. It, it certainly is. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, it, it, it'll, it may make people buy it. It may make people not. Right, well, let's have a look at the NPC quarterfinals this weekend. First game up is the one that I'm going to be paying most attention to, Wellington versus Counties. Wellington come out on top at the end of pool play because Tasman bottled it in the Shield clash, gave away the Shield and the chance at top spot. Counties beat Wellington a couple of weeks ago. That result now seems like it might work against Counties <laughs> come the quarterfinals in Wellington. No, I don't think so because I think the County side has got their belief. I was fortunate enough to come to that, that game and I flew back on the plane um, sitting next to Jonathan um, Tamatini yep. and I was talking to him through and, and they are really uh, measured in their approach and understanding that it may, you know, they've already mm. worked it out that if it was to be Wellington, they didn't know at this time when we were having this conversation, but, um, you know, as a senior leader on that side and they seem very composed and, and focused on focusing on themselves mm. and not just thinking about Wellington because that's what they did well when they put all those points on. However... The Wellington side that played on that night to the Wellington side that played Hawke's Bay on the weekend, they got a lot of key players back from injury. Mm. So, especially in the type five, and where Wellington struggled in that game was in the collision area and set piece. It's not going to be, I suppose, as easy or as front football, and it's away from home. So there's a, there's a few elements, but I think if there's going to be an upset this weekend, it's that game, and I know it seems weird for eight versus one, but counties have just peaked right at the right time. And when they were under pressure against Manawatu on the weekend, man, they went back to their DNA of, they've got the best ruck in the competition. And I don't mean that just on uh, a gut feel. Statistically, they have the best speed of ruck ball and dominance in the carry and the collision area. If they just try to, you know, play that simple game that they went to, they probably rushed it against Manawatu. two. When they went to their simple game, let's just win collisions, let's get those four metre carries and then let's send it out to our speed. They're tough. They are, they are really tough and they've got a strong bench. So it's <laughs> strong going to bench? Be a, yeah. Cam Roygaard and Dalton <laughs> Lee. No, no, no. Well, they might <laughs> yes. not be there this weekend. <laughs> right. They might not be there this weekend, but no, normally they always have a strong bench and they finish really strong. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was amazing to see them come back, seeing Roygaard back. Cam Roygaard. Wow. I mean, and it was really good for Dalton. Like, he did go off with an injury, so I hope that's not too bad. 
But I think Dalton just reminded everyone, you know, because he got that injury, mm. Sam's come in and Sam's played extremely well, but Dalton just gave us a snippet of what makes him great, and especially on that edge. Not only his try, but his offload ability, his work around the breakdown and his physicality um, was impressive in, in the 19 minutes he got out there. Mm. Down the left edge, Manu two. well, the right edge for them, Manu two must yeah. be having nightmares. <laughs> well, I mean, they didn't do too wrong. Like, they... They're All Blacks. And I think across the whole weekend, all the All Blacks looked like All Blacks. You know, like in every game, they stood out. They stood out as a level above, and that's what you'd want to see. That's what the All Black coaches would have wanted to see. Yeah, yeah. Let's look at these other games. Bob Hawke's Bay is the first one up on Saturday. Um, that is an either way kind of game, isn't it? Well, same quarterfinal as last year. Yeah. And same place, same time, same day. And I, I have no doubt Bay of Plenty have not forgotten that, that late uh, surge from Hawke's Bay to get that result. And as we know, Hawke's Bay went on to win the semi and nearly won the final. I think this Bay of Plenty side could go the distance. I think it may be a step too far for the Magpies. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> I apologise, mate. I'll be supporting you, I promise. But uh, I, think, I think it'll be Bop's time. Right. Taranaki versus Waikato. How, how much do they celebrate? <laughs> That's probably the question. Yeah, not much. Um, um, I'll tell you a story. In 06, when we won at a harbour, it was the last, last round and we'd, we'd finished second. We played seventh side Otago at home and lost it because there was a little bit too much celebrating. You know, we ru it ruined our NPC <laughs> season because it was all too much. Where I think this side differs is a lot of those players have already won it. Yeah. So it's, I'm not saying it's not unique, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not the new focused. shiny toy, if yeah. you know what I mean. Like they, to back up um, and win this title again, um, I, I think there's just too much seniority and maturity in that squad mm. to not um, deliver and, and, and win that result. It is a hell of a backline, the Naki backline. Yeah, it, it, it is, and I've been together a long time, and I, honestly, I've been raving about one player in the side for a number of years at NPC. He's done it with the Chiefs, but Daniel Rona is mm. seriously talented. He, he is someone that you know, must be knocking on that All Blacks 15 door. And I know he doesn't always start or get big minutes at Super Rugby, but every time he does, man, he delivers. Whether it's second five, centre, wing, fullback, doesn't matter. The, the, the kid is very special. Yeah, and he's surrounded by special talent too. Yeah, uh, and both sides. Yeah. But, you know, he, he is one of these players that... I almost liken them to Reno Ranger. They just pop up in the right space. Yeah. They're always in the right spot at the right time and yeah. um, always make uh, an impact on games and you always remember them. Well, he certainly um, does that for me every time I see him play. And the last game of the weekend, Tasman versus Canterbury. Tasman are going to be seething because now they've got to absolutely nail it. They could have been top dog. They could have been at home. They could have had the shield in the cabinet. They're going to be angry. And they're playing the big brother, Canterbury. Yeah, yeah. I... This is, this is a hard one because Tasman have got a lot of injuries in that type five. They've lost a lot of key players. They've lost, lost their original skipper in Quinton Strange. And yes, they'll be seething, but I feel like Canterbury losing to Harbour the way they did, man, they were, they were much, that was probably their best polished performance. And I know two All Blacks stood out in Derry and Bell mm. um, against Waikato, but you know, Waikato played really well. Um, so it, it took a lot to beat them. Um, you know, it's a little bit like the Battle of the Bridge. I, I, this, this one means a lot to both sides. I will... I'll tip Tasman, just, but I do think Canterbury... I don't think if Canterbury win, it's an upset. I just feel like they've, they've bounced back after that, that embarrassment against North Harbour. Mm. It has been an interesting NPC season a because great... there've been ups and downs across the board. And you didn't know what was happening until the, the Shield game was over. Yeah. You know, like uh, the Bay of Plenty Auckland game, we, we sort of knew beforehand. The Bay of Plenty players didn't, obviously, because they, they were prepping. But, you know, to go down to the second to last game to decide the finals, you can't ask for much more than that. At both ends. 
Yeah. But we won't talk about Harper. <laughs> we talk well, about there's Harper. a reason why Brent's not here today. <laughs> you certainly don't want to be celebrating on a Monday at this time of the year. <laughs> In three weeks' time, you do. No, that's for sure. So keep an eye out for that. NPC quarterfinals this weekend, plenty to watch. And, of course, the Black Ferns will play against France next week as well. So plenty of footy coming up this weekend. Thanks once again for joining us. Thanks to James Parsons. Hoping that Brent Hall is in a good condition right about now. We'll see him next week as well. So thank you to the studio and everyone who helps us put this show together. Send us an email. AotearoaRugbyPod at sky.co.nz. Get into the YouTube comments section. We'll keep you involved in the show. Kia to Wiki. See you next week.